Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the fifth Sunday in Lent. I am glad to see you all here this morning. When you walked in, you were given a survey. Don't worry about that now. I will explain it during uh, announcement time and give you some time to complete it during then so you can set it aside for now. I invite those who are able to rise and join me in the call to worship. Family of God, we gather as who we are and we bring what we have. We bring joy and sorrow, hope and despair, resources and need, certainty and questions. In this space, we meet the one who parts seas, creates paths, and changes circumstances. Please join in singing our opening hymn, hymn number 101, All People That On Earth Do Dwell. We turn from your truth 
and receive the lies of the enemy, your souls that devalue and condemn, even though your grace is sufficient for us. Mend the brokenness within us. Fortify us with your love, hope, and vision. Shield us from stagnation and despair. Amen. Please join me in a moment of silent reflection. The God of grace sees us fully and loves us fully. May our eyes be ever open to see ourselves as God sees us and restores our soul. Yes. I'd like to pray for my friend Beth Castro. 
What's the name? Beth Castro. Beth Castro. Um, so we pray for Beth. Keep her in our prayers. I like to like all the prayers my mom that she does to assisted living. What's your mom's name? Joy. June. June. We pray for June as she adjusts to assisted living. Then we pray these prayers and those that remain in our hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the Old Testament, Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who whose, whose dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoice. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses of the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheep. And our gospel this reading this morning is from the gospel attributed to John, chapter 19, verses 28 through 30. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scriptures, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus finished, received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I invite those who are able to rise and join in singing hymn number 306, Alas, and did my Savior bleed? And Colin will play this through one time so we get the feel of this hymn.
The first was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The second was, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The third was, Woman, behold thy son, behold thy mother. The fourth was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the fifth that we will explore today is, I am thirsty. The moment when Jesus says, I am thirsty, is, give, it is given a sponge soaked in vinegary wine on a hyssop is more complex and more compelling than it first appears. In the book of Exodus, hyssop was used to sprinkle the blood of the Passover lamb on the doorposts of the Jews to ensure God's protection. Now there is a new lamb of God. As Raymond E. Brown pointed out, John used the image of a hyssop, a leafy flowering plant, even though it is difficult to imagine how such a plant could bear the weight of a sponge soaked in vinegary wine. Here is a place in the narrative of the cross where, rather than reporting the events, the evangelist is making a larger point. John opened his gospel with John the Baptist crying out, Behold the Lamb of God. At the end of the earthly odyssey, the Lamb is being symbolically linked to the Passover drama. I read, I am thirsty quite personally as an emblem of the urgency and efficacy of communion. When the people of God thirst, we turn to the altar. We turn to the words of institution that Jesus used at the Last Supper, creating an act of remembrance, as Paul described it in 1 Corinthians, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink from it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. For sacramental Christians, and I feel that I am one, the church service is the center of faith, for it is always there. Devout or distracted, ecstatic or gloomy, we are told to obey the commandment to do this in remembrance of me. And in so doing, we are mysteriously but unmistakably in communion with God the Father. Through the sacrifice of God the Son, by the working of the Holy Spirit. No matter how we feel, no matter what kind of day or week we've had, our thirst is satisfied and order is restored to a broken world, if only for a moment. In a 1955 letter, Flannery O'Connor described attending a dinner party of New York intellectuals at Mary McCarthy's. The evening dragged on and on, and ultimately talk turned to communion. A lapsed Roman Catholic, Catholic, Mary McCarthy said, when she was a child and received communion, she thought of it as the Holy Spirit, he being the most portable person of the Trinity. Now she thought of it as a symbol and implied that it was a pretty good one. An unlapsed Catholic, O'Connor related her reply to McCarthy. I then said, in a very shaky voice, well, if it's a symbol, to hell with it. That was all the defense I was capable of. But I now realize that this is all I will ever be able to say about it, outside of a story, except that it is the center of existence for me, all the rest of life is expendable. It is uncomfortable to focus too much on sin and shortcoming in mainstream theology, 
when the Episcopal Church reformed its Book of Common Prayer in the 1970s, it dropped a key phrase from the General Confession of Sin, one that acknowledged there is no health in, in us. But John Henry Newman wrote that wrote a very different kind of prayer of humble access. And I think we learn more from the words of a dead Victorian than we ever learn from a revised confession. Before Holy Communion, Newman would pray, Thou seest not only the strains and scars of past sins, but the mutilations, the deep cavities, the chronic disorders which have left in my soul. Thou seest the innumerable living sins living in their power and presence, their guilt and their penalties which clothe me. Yet thou comest, thou seest more perfectly, yet thou comest. Through the church service, God comes everywhere to all sorts and conditions of people. In his book, The Shape of Liturgy, the Anglican monk Je Gregory Dix wrote a prose poem to the service. It bears reading in its entirety. On the command, do this in remembrance of me, Dix observed, was ever another command so obeyed. For century after century, spreading slowly to every continent and country and among every race on earth, this action has been done in every conceivable human circumstance for every hu conceivable human need from infancy and before it to extreme old age and beyond it, from the pinnacles of earthly greatness to the refuge of fugitives in the caves and dens of earth. Men have found no better thing than this to do for kings at their crownings and for criminals going to the scaffold, for armies in triumph, or for a bride and bridegroom in a little country church, for the proclamation of a dogma, or for a good crop of wheat, for the wisdom of the parliament of a mighty nation, or for a sick old woman afraid to die, for a schoolboy sitting in examination, or for Columbus setting out to discover America, for the famine of the whole provinces, or for the soul of a dead lover, in thankfulness because my father did not die of pneumonia, because the Turk was at the gates of Vienna, for the repentance of Margaret, for the settlement of a strike, for a son for a barren woman, for Captain so-and-so wounded and prisoner of war, while the lions roared in the nearby amphitheater, on the beach, at Dunk Dunkirk, tremulously by an old monk on the 50th anniversary of his vows, furtively by an exiled bishop who had honed timber all day in a prison camp, and best of all, week by week and month by month, on a hundred thousand Sundays, faithfully, unfailingly, across the parishes of Christendom, the pastors have done this just to make the Holy Communion of people of God. In a letter to a goddaughter on the occasion of her confirmation, C.S. Lewis laid out a practical understanding of the power of the sacrament. Don't expect, I mean, don't come time and don't demand that when you are confirmed or when you make your first communion, you will have all the feelings you would like to have. You may, of course, but also you may not. Don't worry if you don't get them. They aren't what matter. The things that are happening to you are quite real things, whether you feel as you would wish or not. Just as a meal will do a hungry person good, even if he has a cold in the head, which will rather spoil the taste. Our Lord will give us right feelings if he wishes, and then we must say thank you. If he doesn't, then we must say to ourselves and to him that he knows us best. For years after I had become a regular communicant, 
I can't tell you how dull my feelings were and how my attention wandered at the most important moments. It is only in the last year or two that things have begun to come right, which just shows how important it is to keep on doing what we are told. Believers dare not come to the Lord's table with a repentant heart. Whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord is an unworthy manner, as Paul puts it, drinks judgment to himself. That should be a sobering warning, especially when the apostle adds that because of this offense, many have fallen ill or died. Any pastor who takes the word of God seriously should never administer communion without adequately warning partakers. Those who are unrepentant should flee the table rather than trivialize the sacred. And God does not view this sacred act lightly. Pat Novak, pastor in a non-sacramental denomination, discovered this when he was serving in a, as a hospital chaplain intern just outside of Boston several years ago. Pat was making his rounds one sum summer morning when he was called to visit a patient admitted with an undiagnosed ailment. John, a man in his 60s, had not responded to any treatment. Medical tests showed nothing. Psychological tests were inconclusive. Yet he was wasting away. He had not even been able to swallow anything for two weeks. The nurses tried everything. Finally, they called the chaplain's office. When Pat walked into the room, and John was sitting limply in his bed, strung with IV tubes, staring listlessly at the wall. He was a tall, grandfatherly man, balding a little, but in his sallow skin sung loosely on his face, neck, and arms, where the weight had dropped from his frame. His eyes were hollow. Paul was terrified. He had no idea what to do, but John seemed to brighten a bit as soon as he saw Pat's chaplain badge and invited him to sit down. As they talked, Pat sensed that God was urging him to do something specific. He knew he was to ask John if he wanted to take communion. Chaplain interns were encouraged to ask this type of thing at the hospital, but Pat did. At that, John broke down. I can't, he cried. I've sinned and can't be forgiven. Pat paused a moment, knowing he was about to break policy again. Then he told John about 1 Corinthians 11 and Paul's admonition that whoever takes communion in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself. And he asked John if he wanted to confess his sin. John nodded gracefully. To that day, Pat can't remember the particular sins John confessed, nor would he say if he did, but he recalls that it did not strike him as particularly egregious, yet it had been draining the life from this man. John wept as he confessed, and Pat laid hands on him, hugged him, and told John his sins were forgiven. Then Pat got the second urging from the Holy Spirit, ask him if he wants to take communion. He did. Pat gave John a Bible and told him he would be back later. Already, John was sitting up straighter with a flicker of lights. Pat visited a few more patients and then ate some lunch in the hospital cafeteria. When he left, he wrapped an extra piece of bread in a napkin and borrowed a coffee cup in the cafeteria. He ran out to the shops a few blocks away and bought a container of grape juice. Then he returned to John's room and celebrated communion with him. John took the bread and chewed it slowly. It was the first time in weeks he had been able to take solid food in his mouth. He took the cup and swallowed. He had been set free. Within three days, John walked out of the hospital. The nurses were so amazed, they called the newspaper, which later featured the story of John and Pat, appropriately, in the life section. Jesus was thirsty and was given a bit of vinegary wine. We thirst and we are given everything. He suffered that we might be saved. He died that we might live. Amen. This time we give with our hearts open. 
to those in need and those around us in this church and beyond. The morning offering will now be brought forward. so many. 
during his ministry, and he broke it, just as his body would be broken. And he gave it to his friends, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup. full of the sweet and sour juice of the vine, and made the ordinary into the extraordinary by saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it, in remembrance of me. At this meal, Jesus surrendered his heart. In the garden, Jesus surrendered his body. On the cross, Jesus surrendered his soul. And now we surrender ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Through the mystery of faith, we eat this bread and drink this juice, keeping alive the spirit of Jesus within us and remembering his love poured out for us with our Creator God, our friend Jesus Christ, and our Comforter of the Holy Spirit, we honor the covenant of love. Those difficult to love, to forgive, those difficult to forgive, and to act with kindness, even when not inclined to do so. May God's peace make a home in you now and forever. At this time, we eat the bread, and I invite you to eat the bread on your own when you feel inclined to do so, as a symbol of your individual unity with God. Please join me in drinking from the cup. This is the cup of, this is the blood of Christ. Join now together as a symbol of our unity as a church. Let us pray. Oh God, how great is the gift that you save for your fearers. How sweet is your grace to those who love you. Kindle the flames of your love in us. Save the blessing of your grace in our hearts, not for judgment or to fall into judging, but to receive glory, purity of soul and body, and to live with you, survive for you, and to continue with your grace. So guide us to your holiness and fill us with your grace and consecrate us with your soul. Glory to you, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, now and until eternity. Amen. So we'll start with the survey that was passed out. The survey I am doing for two classes, actually. I am taking an ethics class and a climate change class. And for my ethics class, we were told specifically to do a survey. So this survey will be used for both classes. So I ask you to take a moment and fill it out. And I will just give you a moment to fill that out. It's self-explanatory, so I just ask you to answer the question. And then if you could just leave those on the back windowsill for me when you leave the church so that I have them. I really appreciate this.
Does anyone need more time? Okay. Okay, the next Nifty 50s meeting will be April 12th at noon at the Family Tree. Are they seeing you for this, Judy? Oh, Sharon. Okay, so if you have questions, see Sharon. And there, is there a sign-up sheet in the Fellowship Hall, Sharon? Yes, okay, so there's a sign-up sheet in the Fellowship Hall and see Sharon. All right, I got this. The next consistory meeting is also April 12th at 9 o'clock, and then Faith for the Future will meet at 10.30. So there might be some changes that need to be made, but we'll do the best we can. Uh, we are collecting for Ukraine. There is a box in the uh, fellowship hall that you will notice it because it is the color of the Ukrainian flag. You can't miss it. Buff Buffalo Balloons Company on Maple Road is collecting donations to be taken to Ukraine. We are going to collect here and then take them up to partner with them. They don't need more clothing or anything like that, but what they can use is cold medication in pill form, so medication in pill, pill not liquid, but pills. Um, quick clot trauma packs, heavy duty gauze, and monetary donations can be given to me or Karen, and those will go for bulletproof vests for the citizens who are fighting in their, in their country in their clothing right now. Uh, ask Karen, but probably Buffalo Blues, because we're, we're not, it's not for us. Unless Jackie wants to give us cash, no, Buffalo Blues. And on the back of your bulletin is a Holy Week schedule. We are doing a Maundy Thursday service here, and if you are looking for a Good Friday service, Epiphany is doing a Good Friday service at 6 o'clock. They are also doing a fish fry beforehand. You do need to call, and I will put information in the email tomorrow. You need to call and order ahead of time. So, and then I don't know the price. They didn't tell me the price yet. But you, there is a number to call and reserve, and you can probably ask them the price. But you do not have to go to the fish fry in order to go to the service. So if you want to go to the service at 6 o'clock, and I encourage you, I will be there um, for that. And then we had loaned out our church. We are lo loaning out our church to Jennifer, who is one of the Girl Scout leaders. She is coming in through the month of April for... She is a physical therapist. She and the social worker are coming in once a week while the building she is in is being released and being worked on. And she emailed me this week and said it was the perfect solution. She has one child that they did not have a place to see. So they're coming in Wednesdays from uh, 12 to 1 30. The only problem they had was he was getting way too distracted in the Sunday school room because it was too much fun so they had to move to the conference room. <laughs> but, but the conference room works for him but the Sunday school room was too much fun. So but she said she said to thank all of you for loaning her the building because um, they wouldn't know how to give, give this child his needs his social worker and physical therapist if it was not for us. Are there any other announcements? Yes? I just wanted to clarify that Lil Blood did not require surgery. Oh, Lil Blood did not require surgery. Just a procedure. Oh, just a procedure. Okay, thank you so much.
Then if there are no other announcements, I invite you to rise and join in singing hymn number 123, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sat.